Thank you, and I'll try to keep this as short and kind of succinct as possible to leave time for questions. What I want to do today is to very briefly introduce some of the intended socio-ecological implications of basically moving into a world where meat would no longer come from muscle or milk from mammals, but rather where these products could be produced as proponents and researchers always say kind of from the, organism, uh, from the cell up or from the gene up or kind of produced from scratch rather than from the animal down. Uh, what proponents tend to call cellular agriculture or a post-animal bioeconomy. And these are some high-profile projects that I think many of you have encountered, at least encountered representations of them, encountered stories about them in the past. Um, and they've both attracted significant praise and quite a lot of criticism. And today, I want to kind of steer away from these often rather polarized kind of viewpoints, either kind of a boosterist praise, this is going to save the world, uh, save the animals, kind of uh, make everything better, etc., or kind of that this would be a natural, artificial, yucky, alt based in the lab. Uh, instead, I, in my research, wanted to basically follow what anthropologist uh, Stefan Helmreich talks about as an aesthetics of conversation rather than an aesthetics of critique, basically rather than to find the faults in these projects, rather to find, than to find kind of where I could dismiss them. I've, want, I've wanted to understand the future visions that are emerging. I've wanted to understand the research environments that are emerging. And I think that this is also something that I want to carry with me in this presentation today, because I think that there is quite a lot of interesting openings for conversations in how what I do might be very different from what some people at uh, Framtidens Lantbruk, uh, the research group, are doing, the future of agriculture. Uh, and what we do uh, are both quite different from what these researchers that I'm studying kind of in my research project are doing. So I think there's a great span here and a great opening for discussions and what I want to understand is basically what kind of research environments emerge around cultured meat and cellular agriculture? What kind of future visions emerge? And also, what can these research environments and future visions tell us about our time today? So basically, stu studying intended futures and future visions to say something about the present. Roadmap for today. First, kind of... Uh, provide a common ground, and here I think that we're all more or less on familiar ground in uh, kind of that we recognize these problems. They're often kind of uh, given a lot of attention, especially the environmental implications of meat and dairy-intensive diets. Thereafter, I want to provide a brief chronology of cultured meat and cellular agricultural developments, basically what has happened during, well, almost two decades soon, actually. Where are we now, and what can we see in this development? And third, what does cultured meat and cellular agriculture actually offer? I'm going to talk partly about uh, the potential environmental impacts of these, uh, but I'm also going to comment particularly on presumptions and prominent visions within kind of promissory discourse within how proponents present these hypothetical products. So this part is basically going to be in two parts in itself. One drawing on other people's estimates and other people's life cycle assessments of these products and the other one drawing more on my own research where I've followed researchers around uh, to conferences where I've interviewed the researchers, proponents, activists, uh, entrepreneurs, investors, and uh, where I've also tried to trace these discourses through time and through space. And the fourth then, kind of uh, maybe try to think a bit about the relevance for thinking about the future of these industries and the future of animal agriculture or kind of the livestock sectors. So. Figures that we all know, more or less. Today, we eat more meat per capita 
on a global scale. We eat more shell eggs per capita on a global scale. We eat milk, more milk, drink more milk, eat more dairy products per capita on a global scale. And often these increases are rather dramatic if we're looking at uh, the latter half of the 20th century. For example, meat here at 294 percent increase over 50 years from 1963 to 2013. And this is sometimes kind of framed as due to a bigger global population today, but I think that we need to remember that the increase in the world's human population is not close to this figure at least. From 1963 to 2013, we had an increase in about, well, from uh, just over 3 billion people to just over 7 billion people, about 120, 122% increase here, whereas at least for shell eggs and meat, the increase is much bigger. So it's obviously not only about a rising global population, there is something more to it. And also, there is an expected continuation of these trends. As Gerber and his co-authors put it in a Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations report three years ago, demand for milk was expected to rise 58% between 2010 and 2050. Demand for meat was expected to rise 73%. And this has, of course, led to numerous publications trying to somehow make sense of these developments. And the introduction of food as not only always a kind of crucial cultural concern, but also a crucial concern when it comes to environmental <coughs> sorry, environmental impact and when it comes to sustainable development. I think this report, Livestock's Long Shadow, that came a decade ago was probably an eye-opener to many. It basically, an influential report on livestock's global environmental impact. Figures that are frequently cited in contemporary work, and including some of the work that I've seen surfacing here at SLU Ultima, basically how livestock, or the livestock sectors, I should say rather, uh, would be responsible for 18% of total greenhouse gas emissions, 30% of the ice-free surface, land surface would be used by the livestock sector, or 70% of all agricultural land if pastures and spaces for feed production are accounted for, 8% of human water use, but also how animal agriculture therefore should rank, as time for that all, says in this report, should rank as one of the leading focuses for environmental policy. A later Food and Agricultural Organization report puts these figures slightly lower, at least for greenhouse gas emissions, attributes 14.5% of the global to human total to uh, the livestock sectors with beef, cattle, and milk produ production responsible for uh, just over 60%, 61% of these emissions. But also how, because the global livestock sector contributes to a significant share of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, uh, there, it could also deliver a significant share when it comes to mitigation efforts and how, as they put it, uh, a 30% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions would be possible if producers in a given system, region, climate, adopted the technologies and practices currently used by the 10% of producers with lowest emission intensity. That's in their words. We also see it here at SLU Ultona. Basically how land within Sweden could be used perhaps in a better way to ensure diets that still contained meat, still contained dairy, but less so 
than today, and importantly, partly because of this, diets that could radically lower greenhouse gas emissions from what we eat compared to the situation in Sweden today. Other reports, other reports have instead targeted consumers. This is a publication that I think many of you have seen as well. Uh, Schöttguiden, the meat guide from uh, Världsnaturfonden, the Swedish branch of the WWF, the World Wildlife Foundation, uh, where they target consumers stating that these could make a heroic contribution, in their words, through eating less but better meat and game here, uh, generally being the best choice. And how that could ensure a meat diet of about 500 grams of meat per week, uh, translating into maybe about three moderate portions, 125 grams each, and two or three sandwiches with some meat on them. But of course, we've also seen more overtly radical kind of critiques of the political economy of animal agriculture or the livestock sector. For example, in Tony Weiss's uh, rather recent book, well, it's about two years old now, uh, The Ecological Hoofprint, where he, on the one hand, criticizes the way that increased meat consumption would be kind of the fate of the global population and how we kind of see meatification of diets as a shorthand for modern diets, so kind of the modernization of societies, but also, importantly, how he says that we're ensnared in what he calls a grain oil seed livestock complex, where he links increases in uh, other sectors of industrialized agricultural production to the way that diets have been transformed and how meat and milk producing livestock could provide a kind of sink for the overproduction of, for example, grain, the overproduction of soy in other agricultural sectors. So we see a whole raft of publications from radical publishers, from uh, environmental activist groups, from academics, from important institutional players, all trying to come to terms with, understand and tackle the livestock sector's environmental impact on a global scale. <coughs> and this is where we could insert cultured meat and cellular agriculture in how, much like, for example, the uh, Gerber, Gerber report, tackling climate change through livestock, much like this report envisioned technological developments as a way to produce milk, meat, etc. more efficiently, so do these researchers, so do these entrepreneurs, so do these activists, but with a very radical twist to it, or very kind of, and I'm not saying radical here in a political sense, I'm saying radical as kind of radically different, or kind of something that really changes uh, the nature of these production processes, and that's how they want to bypass the animals, how they want to produce what they sometimes call animal agricultural products without the animal or post-animal products through a variety of technologies. When we're talking about cultured meat, I think many of you might have seen the burger that was presented in August 2013 in London, probably the product that got most of the media attention here, uh, that was built on basically cell culturing techniques where they cultured meat cells, assembled these ones, they had kind of differentiated into myotubes, uh, assembled these and uh, produced a 85 gram patty of kind of pure meat, well, actually pure muscle cells. I should say. And this is the technology that we see with three companies today, all trying to pursue their own versions of this. Mosa Meat, which came out of the same team of researchers that produced the first burger. Uh, Memphis Meats uh, on the west coast of the US 
ironically, since that's kind of far from Memphis, and Modern Meadow in Brooklyn, New York. They're all working with kind of tissue engineering technologies, culturing muscle cells in order to assemble meat products. Earlier attempts instead tried to kind of nurture full muscle explants, basically little pieces of muscle that resembled the muscle that we actually have in our bodies. But we also see this kind of reoccurring dream of 3D printing meat products, basically how often the steak is seen kind of as the ultimate goal of cultured meat and how theoretically kind of mixing fat cells and meat and muscle cells could allow one to 3D print a kind of steak-like texture. No company is actually pursuing this really at the moment and it's very much kind of a far-fetched semi-science fiction like ID. With cellular agriculture, we're moving into a set of companies that are often bundled together with the cultured meat companies, but where the uh, production processes are quite different in how instead of working with the cells, many of these companies are working instead actually with genetically modified uh, microorganisms and how these oh, how microbes are genetically modified to produce erstwhile kind of animal agriculture products we've got egg white produced through these technologies we've got gelatin we've got rhino horn we've got uh, milk proteins and kind of fatty acids in order to deconstruct and then reconstruct milk and here Often the argument is that these technologies are the ones that actually move beyond <coughs> utilizing the animal there at all in how they don't need access to any living animals. They only need access to the genetic material. And Gelson provides a rather illustrative example of this in how they produced their first product not through using a species alive today, but rather how they produced their first batch of Gelson, oh, sorry, there, Gelson gelatin through using Mastodon DNA. Basically, how they explicitly utilized uh, a species that had gone extinct to show that they don't need an animal at all to produce gelatin. The history then of these products. It's a history where we can see, I think, some interesting twists and turns, which actually says a lot about the nature of these fields. The first patent uh, came from a rather kind of uh, colorful set of characters in the Netherlands. Uh, just before the uh, turn of the millennium, uh, Van Eelen, a medical doctor with a kind of decade-long interest in producing meat in vitro. Van Koten, a businessman and former pirate radio DJ. And Wiet Westerhof, a University of Amsterdam dermatologist. They filed a pa patent in 1999. Not much actually came out of this patent, but we see here a first attempt to provide some kind of scientific list, scientifically sound method for producing cultured meat. I could, of course, start earlier. In a sense, I will move back through time uh, in a couple of slides and how we do have an important prehistory in science fiction from the late 19th century and onwards, really. And we do have an important prehistory in some rather kind of long-standing political future visions. 2000, uh, we see a NASA, the North American Space Travel, well, uh, they're a kind of space agency, uh, where NASA financed research on cultured meat or goldfish meat, 
um, that should ensure the morale of the crew on a hypothetical long-haul space travel, a Mars expedition, say. And here, the nurtured muscle explants, their end products were actually not consumed, but they were cooked, they were spiced up, and they were presented to what they called an odor and appearance panel that at least deemed them potentially acceptable as food. But we also see the very, f the very same year artists moving into this. And I think already here we see some of the rather important kind of entanglements of kind of activists, artists, investors, uh, academics, a whole raft of kind of public sector interests, etc. Uh, where uh, Oron Katz and Ionat Sir produced their tissue engineered steak number one, which they called the first attempt to use tissue engineering for meat production without the need to slaughter animals. And thereafter they moved over to a new product or a new project, very much building on this, disembodied cuisine, where they cultured frog tissue or what they've called frog steaks that was served at a dinner during the L'Art Biotech exhibition in Nantes in 2013. And they used frog cells here to <coughs> basically poke fun of, on the one hand, the French public's distaste for kind of uh, tampering too much with food or for kind of genetic in engineering, etc., etc. And on the other hand, with many others kind of distaste for eating frogs as food. And also kind of further illustrating the spectacular nature of this particular project. When they served these kind of so-called frog steaks to the diners, they actually had the frogs still alive in the room with them. So basically you had people eating tissue from animals that could actually see them eat it. The year thereafter, very important in retrospect, the year when New Harvest, an increasingly influential, primarily US-based uh, NGO, started. And they began very much with promoting cultured meat, but they've become absolutely crucial for the kind of emerging field of cellular agriculture and the way that many various products, many various technologies are discussed together. We also see the very same year the first large-scale publicly funded research project. Two million euros from the Dutch state to spur a national in vitro meat research consortium where they put together three universities, Amsterdam, Utrecht uh, and uh, Eindhoven, and one industry partner, Mr. Stegemann, a meat manufacturer, uh, for four years, between 2005 and 2009. Neither that project actually led to any edible tissue being produced, but the burger that was produced and eaten in 2013 very much followed from this project as Mark Post who uh, was the head of the research team producing the burger, was also part of the latter stage of this project. 2005, we also see the first appearance of these discussions in uh, peer-reviewed academic articles with Edelman et al.'s piece, In Vitro Cultured Meat Production. And here we actually see Matheny there was also the founder of New Harvest. So here, already here we actually see the importance of New Harvest to how these, report, uh, these research projects are presented and how they are conducted. We see an in vitro meat workshop in Norway in 2007 that is in turn followed by uh, the first in vitro meat symposium at the Norwegian Food Research Institute in Oslo, Norway, the same location in 2008, we see how the high-profile <coughs> animal rights, animal welfare, 
NGO, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, how they initiate a campaign where they wanted to award one million US dollars to the first laboratory to use chicken cells to create commercially viable in vitro test tube meat. No laboratory ever actually came forward to even try to claim this money because no laboratory at the time came close to producing in vitro uh, chicken meat at all and even far less commercially viable in vitro test tube chicken meat. We see, again, returning to Scandinavia, a ESF exploratory workshop on in vitro meat being held at Chalmers in Gothenburg. And this is often credited as the gathering where in vitro meat was actually rebranded. How researchers would, and especially kind of uh, the proponents, the researchers working with these tissues, how they should call them cultured because it kind of sounds safer and more kind of homely than in vitro, which I guess to many would sound more kind of tied to biomedical research, tied to kind of laboratories, whereas cultured would be tied to, well, yeah, you've got culturing in yogurt, for example. <coughs> Three, um, two years thereafter, then would be the moment that many of you have seen many reports from already. The first burger served in London to a three-person test panel. Josh Schoenwald, a author who's been writing extensively on the future of food and especially kind of spectacular visions for the future of food. Uh, Mark Post, the head of the team, producing it. And <coughs> Honey Ritzler, a nutritionist, Three months of production, around $330,000 or 250,000 euros or 215,000 pounds or 2.2 million Swedish crowns to produce this, funded by Google co-founder Sergey Brin. And actually, though these costs in themselves might sound spectacular, when I've been uh, discussing this with researchers involved in the process, they say that that figure was actually just kind of not taken out of thin air, but it's a figure kind of mostly used to illustrate that this is expensive. The actual costs would be much higher because these costs don't actually include the wage of the researchers working with this or kind of the indirect costs tied to laboratory space. So spectacular as 2.2 million for a burger might be, it's actually not enough, kind of, it was more expensive. Produced through cells harvested through biopsies on two cows, a blonde aquatin and a Belgian blue, both raised on organic farms. A second product were thereafter presented, and now we're back in the US where Modern Meadow served steak chips at Google's Soul for X. So a gathering of kind of techno technology enthusiasts and researchers. Moving on, we see basically from 2014 and onwards how <coughs> cultured meat companies and cellular agriculture companies also started to attract venture capital. So not only public funding, but now also funding from private institutions. Investors early illustrative examples would be $10 million to Modern Meadow from uh, Li Kaxing, the uh, richest man in Asia, uh, to, to produce in vitro meat and in vitro leather. $2 million to Move Free, who are trying to produce uh, uh, milk through using uh, genetically modified dairy yeast, and they've since changed their name. So since a couple of months, they're now called Perfect Day Foods. And $1.7 million to Clara Foods for producing 
egg whites through similar technologies, basically utilizing genetically modified microorganisms to produce egg whites. <coughs> we also see new attempts to create a scientific society. The first attempt would be 2007-2008. Uh, In Norway, in 2015, we had a new international conference called the First International Symposium on Cultured Meat, this time in Maastricht in the Netherlands. Uh, we see new companies being founded. Memphis Meats were founded in 2015. Mosa Meat, coming out of the Maastricht uh, research team, was founded the same year. Uh, Memphis Meats cooked their first product, a beef meatball, earlier this year. And the latest that I want to take up to kind of show how venture capital has increasingly moved in to this field, how Modern Meadow this summer managed to attract $40 million to produce cultured leather. So what we basically see here is not only kind of a long list of events, a long list of things that has happened, but also... I would say three important shifts here, and I'm going to use a slide from an earlier workshop this year. And this is not from one of my presentations, but it's from the guy presenting the actual workshop. And this slide actually illustrates all of these three shifts. This is from the Rewiring the World Food Ecosystem panel held in March this year as at IndieBio, a San Francisco biotechnology accelerator. So basically, a place where they're investing in startups, offering lab space, offering mentorships, and offering funding for four months for biotech companies in exchange for shares in these companies. And it's a setting where food production companies and debates over new food technologies have come to increasingly take a very prominent place. And what we see here, basically, is a picture depicting a rather unified front, basically how what is, at the essence, rather different, or kind of, yeah, rather different uh, technologies are here bundled together as one system. We've got... Tissue culturing, Memphis Meats producing cell cultured meat. We've got Jelson and their kind of post animal mastodont gelatin, remember, Clara Foods, uh, the egg whites. But we've also got Tofurky producing kind of more conventional plant based alternatives, impossible food likewise. Uh, so we have a whole raft of technologies presenting, presented as kind of technologies that would disrupt agricultural economies and kind of, yeah, as they put it, rewire the world food ecosystem. And the three shifts there, then. First, we see a shift in where research is taking place. After early debates, early discussions in uh, Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, uh, thereafter research in the ne Netherlands, we see increasingly a lot of it has to do with in the bio. We see increasingly how a lot of research is conducted in the Bay Area, uh, on the west coast of uh, the U.S., the kind of the San Francisco area. We see a shift from public funding to venture capital. So we see a shift from public funding to private funding. And one could add a persistent problem to actually secure kind of meaningful streams of public funding. And we see a shift from cultured meat as the technology and focus to a broad variety of cellular agriculture or kind of post-animal food products, often presented, like here, as one unified front, one unified group. And what then would be the implication of these products. And I'm going to divide this a bit between the <coughs> environmental implications and thereafter move into some of the more kind of cultural, social, economic implications. The hope, of course, is that this would be a much more sustainable way of producing these 
products. This is, for example, from Perfect Day Foods, previously Mufri's environmental impact assessment, their uh, life cycle assessment of their animal-free milk, that it would include 65% less energy production, 84% less greenhouse gas emissions, 91% less land usage, 98% less water consumption. So, so you see a kind of a radical decrease in the resources that would be needed to produce these products. For cultured meat, some of the early hopes were similar. Uh, this is probably the most influential early evaluation of cultured meat made by Hannah Tomisto and uh, Jose Teixeira de Matos. Uh, and to, again, illustrate kind of the importance of new harvest to this field and how it's talked about, how research is conducted, etc. Uh, these two researchers were actually commissioned by new harvest to do this life cycle assessment. <coughs> Compared to kind of the rather abstract average category of conventionally produced environmental meat, oh, sorry, conventionally produced European meat, that should be, they claimed that cultured meat could have 7 to 45 percent lower energy use, but poultry would, however, have lower energy use by, uh, per ton produced, 78 to 96 percent lower greenhouse emissions, 99 percent lower land use, 82 to 96% lower water use. So again, we see hopes for a radical decrease in the resources used. We should, however, stress that this particular life cycle assessment was conducted uh, by basing, uh, basically, estimates in a hypothetical nutrient solution. Basically, when you culture meat, of course, you need to provide nutrients. Uh, and the kind of nutrients that you can provide, the kind of basis you have for these nutrients radically change how much energy, etc., would be used. And here they built a scenario with cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria is yet not applied in any kind of real research projects when it comes to cultured meat. So whether this could be possible is very much kind of in the air at the moment. And therefore, we've seen some <coughs> later, less optimistic life cycle analysis. This is from uh, Matic et al. from last year, where they basically came to the conclusion that land use would be about three times more than in uh, Tuimisto and Teixeira de Matos earlier evaluation that uh, <coughs> energy consumption would be 20 times higher. And also kind of as they added to this, how uncertain all of these figures are. As you see, the black line there showing kind of the range of uncertainty when it comes to these often not even kind of novel technologies, but rather kind of hypothetical, hoped-for technologies for producing meat products. But there's also an other important shift here, if we want to put this in relation to the future of agriculture. And that is, of course, that what they also show is the green here is basically kind of from the agri agricultural sectors. And what we see here is how the energy use, kind of uh, all of these contributors are moving away from kind of agricultural sectors and instead more into industrial sectors. So basically, in this sense, the dream of a kind of post-animal bioeconomy can translate even to kind of a dream of a post-agricultural bioeconomy where <coughs> the energies used up by animals would instead be supplied by industrial processes. 
as they say it. In vitro biomass cultivation may substitute industrial processes for internal biological work done by animal physiologists. That is, meat production in animals is made possible by internal biological functions, temperature, regulation, digestion, oxygenation, etc., fueled by agricultural energy inputs, feed. Producing meat in a bioreactor could mean that these same functions will be performed at the expense of industrial energy rather than biotic energy. As such, in vitro biomass cultivation could be viewed as a renewed wave of industrialization. I think this is extremely <clears throat> important if we want to think about these issues within the broader framework of the future of agriculture. But as they say, all of these evaluations are highly uncertain and they basically state black on white that until working manufacturing facilities have actually been constructed, life cycle assessments are only kind of very hypothetical scenarios. And what we have beside these scenarios are, I would say, equally important futures presented through stories about these futures, presented through more kind of free-floating kind of more ways of telling how we could live with these products because we are being offered something here and this is uh, mark post the man heading first the maastricht university team producing 2013 burger and now mosa meat so basically what are we being offered here well first of all of course we're being offered a reading of meat as on the one hand unsustainable on the one other hand, unavoidable. As New Harvest, the influential NGO, again put it, meat, we love it. We've always loved it. Or, in the words of Maastricht University in their press material when the first burger was produced, humans as a race have shown no sign of wishing to eat less meat. So it's unrealistic to think about eradicating meat from the human diet in the future. A sustainable way of providing it has to be found. So basically, this is presented as an absolute necessity. If people are to continue to eat meat and are not satisfied by vegetable substitutes, a way of producing cultured beef has to be found. So basically, this is being presented as an absolute necessity, but it's also presented as a necessity that we would actually like better than meat today. So it's in a rather kind of, uh, I would say, interesting way presented as, on the one hand, very much the same thing that we have today. This is meat. Proponents, researchers, entrepreneurs would go absolutely mad if anyone called it artificial meat, for example, or lab-grown meat. This is meat, and it should be called meat. But on the other hand, they are promising that... The, this meat would be radically different in how, as I've already kind of stated, how it should be sustainable, less greenhouse gas emissions, less pollution, less disease outbreaks, less land used, etc. But how it should also render meat uncontroversial in that no animals would have to be harmed and how cultured pork, for example, according to some, could be declared kosher, basically how some established taboos could be bypassed through producing meat through new means. And this we also see with some prominent vegan voices, how they've very much taken a stance for this. Peter Singer, the well-known philosopher, author of what has sometimes been called kind of the uh, vegan movement's Bible, Animal Liberation, stated when the first burger was presented that I haven't eaten meat for 40 years, but if invitro meat becomes commercially available, I will be pleased to try it. So we do see how some prominent vegan voices are kind of warming up to the idea of eating cultured meat. But importantly, how meat should also be healthy because since it's produced kind of from scratch, or since it's been produced from the cell up. How, in the words of Mark Post, again, 
the biochemical composition of meat might be changed to make it a healthier or specialized diet product, for example, by increasing the content of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So basically moving from kind of bad fat in meat to good fat in meat. And also, obviously, how meat should be exciting. It should be fun. How it would be possible, because no animals would need to be killed, how it would be possible to eat the meat from exotic endangered animals, or even even though this should be kind of viewed mostly as a tongue-in-cheek comment, I think it's important that it is even mentioned how it could enable victimless cannibalism, basically how humans could eat other humans, because no humans would have to be killed. <coughs> and I think these utterances, these kind of often spectacular scenarios, these spectacular dreams, these stories are important because as, for example, Oriordan, I think, quite rightly tell us, cultured beef is a communication technology that brings publics into communion around environmental issues of food production. Basically, how this is very much a communication technology in how the researchers are very concerned about how this is consumed, but also in how it gets conversations started before any products are even close to reaching the market. This also shines through in how a lot of activists are talking about this. For example, Isha Datar, the present head of uh, New Harvest, in how the new science of carniculture must be developed responsibly, driven by discourse from the beginning, or <coughs> one of the representatives of IndieBio, the accelerator I showed you the slide from earlier, how basically he frames it as that what they do is to teach skills in communicating technology to a wider audience. And how their demo day, basically when their companies present their first prototypes, is successful because people can come and understand what is going on. And how biotechnology is here presented in a kind of accessible way. So... Almost everybody within this field are in agreement about how kind of the way that these technologies are represented matters quite a lot. And often they are presented as a continuity, the continuation of some rather well-established concerns. Here, in the words of uh, Frederick Edward Smith, the British Secretary for India, how he said that in 2030 it would l no longer be necessary to go to the extravagant length of rearing a bullock in order to eat its steak. From one parent steak of choice tenderness, it will be possible to grow as large and as juicy a steak as can be desired. Or a more famous quote from a more famous politician, Winston Churchill, 50 years hence, we shall es escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. So here we see how it's anchored to some rather kind of well-established, spectacular concerns. Very much the same wordings, more or less, today. Now, not meat, but milk. Uh, one of the uh, representatives of perfect day, or move-free. Every problem with milk stems from the fact that it comes from inside an animal. And when people drink milk, they're not drinking a glass of milk because they want a cow. They're drinking it because they want a glass of milk. And it's a shame that that glass of milk is embedded with inefficiencies. 70% of the cost of a glass of milk comes from the feed that we're given the cow. And those cows are turning that feed inefficiently into milk protein. <coughs> They're also producing body parts that we don't need. They're also producing methane gas that pollutes the atmosphere. Or another kind of illustrative example, but and Fayas, where they say that from a commercial perspective, animals are notoriously unreliable as a raw material for meat production due to illness, stress, and uneven growth. So basically, the only way we've had up until now to actually produce animal products utilizing animals now animals are instead reframed as the very problem of 
animal agriculture. <coughs> but also the visions very much function as a continuity here. In how <coughs> Churchill's and Smith's visions were very much for a more rational way of organizing how we produce food in order to ensure a more rational way of how we actually organize space. As Churchill puts it, if gigantic new resources of power becomes available, food will produce without recourse to sunlight. Vast cellars in which artificial radiation is generated may replace the cornfields of or potato patches of the world. Parks and gardens will cover our pastures and plant fields. When the time comes, there will be plenty of room for the cities to spread themselves again. Or, in the words of Frederick Edward Smith instead, and here we very much see the kind of the dream of a post-agricultural world, how farming would become a rich man's hobby, a charming old world fancy. The same hopes we see today. Two quotes here from Tomisto <coughs> in how on the first part here, how land released from livestock production could be used for production of bioenergy. Uh, furthermore, the land released from agriculture could be utilized for wildlife conservation. And in the second, we're just instead talking about the provision of ecosystem services. So again, we see dream of getting away from the kind of land intensive nature of food production in order to ensure kind of a rather actually quite literal utopian reorganization of how land could be used to what we want to use land for rather than what land has to be used for. And I'm going to end with this as my final slide in order to ensure a couple of minutes to <coughs> question and comments uh, for those who can't stay afterwards. How we also see how these industries are anchored to established existing industries. And here we very much see a kind of a, I would say, kind of a creative class, or kind of the creative class of the kind of hipster nature of these research environments and in how it's increasingly anchored to microbreweries. Microbreweries is kind of the industry that we should think about when we're thinking about a future world built around cellular agriculture or cultured meat. As, again, Isha Datar from New Harvest puts it, carniculture, as they call this, kind of the new food cultures enabled through culturing meat, carniculture might be dressed with similar connotations and aesthetics to the craft, brew, and farm-to-table movements. <coughs> or how Perfect Day Foods, the milk producer, present their products now. That instead of having cows do all the work, we make our milk with a process similar to craft brewing. Using yeast and age-old fermentation techniques, we make the very same milk proteins that cows make. And obviously, in their presentation, even though they're using genetic modification, there's no mentions of this in this kind of short presentation. Instead, what they say is that they use dairy yeast nurtured by science. So here we see kind of how it's anchored to a kind of safe, homely way of presenting these products. And finally, how this, again, would, in proponents, entrepreneurs, activists, researchers, uh, visions, how this would enable more exciting ways of consuming these products. From uh, one of the interviews I've conducted with a representative from Perfect Day Foods, or Move Free, because our process is really akin to a microbrewery process. It's really amenable to small-scale artisans opening up their own microbreweries and producing their own customized artisanal batches of milk. For instance, you could go down the block and try Joseph's milk, and you go down the block in the other direction. Charlene's milk tastes completely different. It's like the whole microbrewed beer industry. That's the kind of thing we envision. So here we see 
again, how what they envision is actually, in a sense, the reversal of how the milk industry has transformed during the uh, 20th century for, into kind of more and more large-scale facilities, instead of back to kind of household-produced milk. And I'm going to end there to kind of open up the floor for conversations, comments, questions. Thank you very much, Eric.